The New York Society for Ethical Culture was founded over 125 years ago and has been progressive, liberal, and proud of it from the beginning. <clears throat> Among our outstanding achievements are the founding of the Visiting Nurse Service and the Ethical Culture Fieldston Schools. We joined with others to establish the NAACP, the ACLU, the Legal Aid Society, and the New York C Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment. Our members have a long tradition of advocacy on civil liberties and human rights issues. We are humanists. We place our faith in a demonstrated capacity of people to do wonderful things. We believe in the worth and dignity of all living beings and seek to respect and protect it. Our conviction is that we must conduct ourselves and the business of our institutions in such a way that we bring out the best in and for all. As a community, we stand for the separation of church and state. We stand We stand for a woman's right to choose. And we stand against the death penalty. Among the commitments that we ethical culturists make to ourselves and the world in general is to be continuously open to new ideas and to always be learning. There is no question that Robert Fisk has given us lots to think about during his career as a journalist for The Independent and author of such important books as Pity the Nation and The Great War for Civilization. For that reason, we are proud to welcome Mr. Fisk back to our auditorium and to be co-sponsoring tonight's event through the donation of the auditorium. I'd like to give special thanks to Nation Books and the Armenian National Committee for making this program possible. Mem And you'll hear from the Armenian National Committee in just a second. Membership at Ethical Culture is open to all who share our values. I invite you to get to know us better. Please stop by our table in the lobby where you can pick up literature and sign up to receive notification of future events. You can also check us out on the web at NYSEC, that's N-Y-S-E-C dot org. And now let's get on with tonight's program. Thanks very much. Uh, good evening. I'm Antranik Kasparian, and on behalf of the organizing committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this lecture, to this evening's lecture by Robert Fisk. Uh, judging by the size of the gathering, uh, I don't think a lengthy intro is required. I think many of you are familiar with Mr. Fisk's affiliation. He's the Middle East correspondent for the London-based Independent. And you're more familiar with his track record, several decades of unflinching journalism reporting from the front lines of various contact zones found throughout the Middle East and Islamic world. Just two words, if I may. Um, Robert Fisk deserves our um, great appreciation um, for many reasons. He's got a witty pen, he's erudite, he says what needs to be said in a timely and a succinct manner. But above all, he's a man of integrity and courage. And I say this for two reasons. Number one, he has put himself in bodily peril on too many occasions. He's been on the front lines of the Lebanese Civil War, He's been in Afghanistan during wars there on more than one occasion. He has been there um, on numerous occasions during the worst days of the Iraqi wars, Iraqi War I, Iraqi War II. But I think even more than the physical discomfort and risk is the fact uh, that Mr. Fisk continues to show a high level of courage in what he actually has to say. It's not simply that he goes out to the trenches, it's what he comes back with from the trenches. At a time when the liberal mainstream in this country and in the West is shrinking daily, at a time when 
being able to speak freely and critique the status quo and call U.S. foreign policy for what it is, imperialistic, has become increasingly not only unfashionable, but frankly not permitted. Um, for someone like Fisk to continue to hammer away from different standpoints, but always with unflinching courage, without any regard for his personal safety or comfort, truly deserves our appreciation before he even says one word this evening. So for that, we're grateful. I too would like to thank our co-sponsors for this evening's event, um, in particular the Nation Institute and Ruth Baldwin who have been uh, good comrades to us on a number of occasions in joint undertakings. Um, certainly the Armenian National Committees of New York and New Jersey and the New York Society for Ethical Culture who are serving as our gracious host tonight. Uh, before I turn it over to Robert, a couple small housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, Robert will be taking questions afterwards. Uh, we'll have a Q&A that will go as long as his patience and ours permit. Um, copies of his latest book, The Great War for Civilization, are available for sale. Uh, you can pick up copies here in the corners. Um, and I don't know if Robert is willing to autograph copies of them, but I imagine that he is. Okay, thumbs up. And finally, I should just note that tonight's talk is conceived uh, actually as the opening plenary of a larger conference entitled Armenians and the Left, which is being organized by the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. And the bulk of that conference will take place actually tomorrow at the CUNY Grad Center from approximately 10 a.m. until, uh, Doug, 6 p.m.? What time, Doug? 6 p.m. Uh, you're invited to participate. Uh, registration details are available outside the hall afterwards. So we encourage you to get involved tomorrow as well. Uh, and that's it as far as housekeeping. I'd like to turn it over to Robert. Uh, enjoy the evening, and we'll see you later. Ladies and gentlemen, I, um, I enjoyed the bit about the mobile phones being switched off because in Dublin, Ireland some months ago, I said that anyone whose mobile phone rang when I was speaking would be sold into slavery. And immediately a mobile phone rang and it was mine. So I'm keeping my mobile phone on and you can do the same. It's newspaper world tonight. I guess I want to talk to you about what I discovered, and this is not a hard sell on my book because at 1,100 pages in the American edition and 1,300 in the English edition because it's in bigger type, you can't sell a book like that unless someone decides to read it. But I guess I wanted to talk to you about how, in a sense, it came to change my view of the Middle East to write it. Um, when I started writing it, it was an attempt to put into print and to put into one volume at 700 pages maximum, or 650, or 750 at the most, an idea that, as a foreign correspondent, it was our job to go out and witness the first pages of history and to tell it how it is so that no one later on can turn around and say, we didn't know, no one told us. But looking now over the book, and because it's so big, I have to keep rereading it to be ready for snotty questions from interviewers who <laughs> have read it more recently than me and more frequently have not read it at all. Um, I realize that in fact it's a book whose theme is probably the need 
to refuse the narrative of history as it is laid down by our presidents and our prime ministers and our generals, and alas, by many of our journalists too. There's a whole chapter in the book about my father, Second Lieutenant Bill Fisk of the 12th Battalion, the King's Liverpool Regiment, who was much older than my mum, was a soldier at the end of the First World War. He, in his old age, became a very cantankerous right-wing conservative man. He referred to black people as niggers. He was a racist and he said he was proud of it. He believed in capital punishment. He believed in um, prisons, magistrates, and I, in his later years, never got on with him. Indeed, when he was dying in a nursing home in England, I didn't go and see him. But in the First World War, he too refused the narrative that was laid down for him. Firstly because, and maybe here there was a ghost of the journalist his son would be, he broke all the rules by taking a camera to the trenches of France. So I actually have photographs of my father in uniform and steel helmet, two pictures of which he actually took above the front line with his hands up like that and brought them down before he got hit by a sniper. Of course, it's the usual picture of uh, mud and broken trees and leafless trees and, and barbed wire. The other way in which he denied the narrative that was set down for him was that at the very end of the First World War, he was ordered to command an execution party. Uh, a group of British soldiers who were ordered to shoot an Australian soldier serving in a British regiment, the same age as my dad, 19 years old, who had killed a British military policeman in Paris after deserting from his unit. And my father refused to obey that order. Um, he said, I will not shoot another man in cold blood. And I think that was the finest thing he ever did in his life. So there's a whole chapter in my book which is devoted to him. In fact, the title of my book, The Great War for Civilization, comes from him too. Because when he died at the age of 93 in 1992, I inherited his campaign medals. And on the back of his First World War campaign medal were written the words, The Great War for Civilization, which he thought he was fighting in 1918. Um, ironically, of course, I decided that had to be the title of my book too. In fact, on the English edition, his medal appears on the spine and a photograph of him taken in August 19 in Arras in uniform appears on the back of the book. So I guess in a way I was trying to make it up to him. And the reason why those words on the back of his medal were so important to me was because in 17 months that followed the First World War, we the victors, primarily the British and French of course, um, drew the borders of Northern Ireland, Yugoslavia, and most of the Middle East. And I have spent my entire professional life as a journalist watching in Belfast and Bosnia and Belgrade and Beirut and Baghdad, how we love honor Matapir as journalists, watching the people in these borders burn. In a very real sense, therefore, the idea of history coming down from my father has very much dominated my life. I remember in 1982, and this is a happy memory of my dad, during the siege of Beirut by the Israelis, the Israeli senior command announced at one point that all journalists should leave the Muslim west of Beirut for their own safety. <clears throat> um, I believed at once that the purpose was to get journalists out of West Beirut so that um, the vast number of civilian casualties that will be caused by um, constant bombardment would not be reported on, as is the case very much in Iraq now, of course, because of the dangers for journalists in moving around. And <clears throat> um, many of us decided to stay in West Beirut. Um, quite a lot of us left, discovering suddenly that they had holidays due to them or other assignments to go on. But <clears throat> many journalists did stay. And one morning, my mother came through on a rare phone call through to Beirut. And she said, uh, we heard on the news last night that the Israelis were telling the journalists to get out of West Beirut. And we wondered what you were going to do. And I said, well, look, frankly, uh, mother, I th Peggy was her name, 
um, I said that I think they're getting us out of here so they can kill more people. And I think the more we stay, the fewer people they can kill. And my mother said, well, I discussed this with Bill, your father, last night. And he thought the same thing. And we, too, think you should stay. <laughs> Not bad for Bill Fisk. Not bad. But this was a very depressing book to write. Um, the last happy story in it is about page 208 in the English edition, smaller print in America, 200 I guess, um, in which uh, Jon Snow, who's a very famous anchorman on British television, uh, who was just a humble reporter like me um, back in 1980, he and I were in the Iran-Iraq war at the beginning and a British ship had become trapped in the Shatal Arab River with rockets and missiles and artillery shells whizzing past it from both the Iranian and the Iraqi front lines. Uh, a story too complex and boring to tell you now, but in any event, John got asked by the ship's owners to rescue the British crew. And he cut me in on his exclusive because he thought that only I could wangle an admiralty map of the Shatal Arab River, of which of course the Iraqis had none at all, um, in order to get his um, colleagues in the Iraqi army. In these days, of course, the Iraqis were the good guys. They were elite forces, right? And we got these Iraqi commanders to come with us on this crazy island trip from which Jon Snow paddled out in his wetsuit along with the Iraqi commanders to get a lifeboat brought down from the British ship and brought across to the shore. And Muggins here, my job, was to stand on the seashore with bullets whizzing by at hip height and pull the rope to bring the lifeboat the lifeboat over along with John and his mates. Anyway, we eventually brought them to shore. And of course, being a British ship, most of the crew were Sri Lankan and Indian. <laughs> and they had also brought with them on the lifeboat all their duty-free color television sets and refrigerators, which they'd bought in Dubai before setting off on their doomed voyage to the Shatal Arab River. And my mournful job after bringing them ashore and receiving their gratified hugs was to take each color television set and refrigerator and chuck it back into the Shatal Arab River. In any event, I went down to a dear friend of mine who was uh, with me at the time and said, you know, that's the last happy story in the book. And she said, ah, that is the end of the sweet stories. And indeed, the next paragraph of the book begins with the words, and that is the end of the sweet stories, because the rest of the book, is an almost unrelieved pageant of torture, suffering, injustice, genocide, ethnic cleansing, betrayal, and pain. Um, a very depressing book to write. I remember uh, one afternoon my um, researcher, Victoria Fontaine, coming downstairs to my library and saying, Robert, I'm getting you out of here. We're going for a walk on the beach. We're going to go out and have a, a beer in a bar. Get away from the book. Um, a deeply depressing book to write, although one which I began with the same enthusiasm that drove me to journalism when I was 12 years old. In those days, on British television, once a week they showed a movie, black and white of course, and I watched Alfred Hitchcock's film Foreign Correspondent, with Joel McCree playing Huntley Haverstock, foreign correspondent for the New York Daily Post. Hands up who's seen a foreign correspondent. Oh, quite a lot, actually, yeah. Well, it's an American movie. We don't have quite so many people in Britain seeing it. In any event, he is sent off by his editor. He's the crime correspondent. And the editor says, what we need in Europe today is a crime correspondent, because he's going off just on the outbreak of World War II. He captures Gestapo agents in London, is chased by the Nazis in Holland, sees the murder of a foreign diplomat, um, gets shot down by a German pocket battleship over the Atlantic, lives to file a scoop, and wins the most gorgeous woman in the movie. And I thought, age 12, I thought this sounds like a bloody good job. It seemed like the right thing. At Locarno, at the film festival not long ago, I had the pleasure of introducing the same movie. It's a real creaky. But nonetheless, um, it was a film that did decide me I wanted to be a journalist. And as I said at the beginning of my life as a foreign correspondent, covering the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, you know, the, the heroes of Stalingrad, the, the, in crossing the Hindu Kush, um, covering the beginning of the Lebanese Civil War, the Iranian Revolution, having missed the French Revolution, it was good to be able to cover the Iranian Revolution, 
Um, life was a great adventure. I was a young man. I still feel it. I still feel I'm 29, but I was 29 then and 30 and 31. And it was only when I finished writing this book where, you know, I, I, I took out all the holidays and the Christmases and the dinners out and pushed together all the suffering that I'd witnessed that I came to a conclusion which I, I find sometimes difficult to say in the United States. I came to the conclusion after reading of the 80, 90 years of injustice that we Westerners have inflicted on the Middle East, how very restrained Muslims have been towards us. As I say, I used to think that our job as journalists was to be the first witness to history. But I had a long conversation, as I've said before, with Amira Haas, that very fine Israeli correspondent on Haaretz newspaper about this same subject. And she said, no, Robert, you're wrong. Our job is to monitor the centers of power, to challenge authority, whenever it wants to go to war, whenever it wants to kill people, and especially when it tells lies to do it. And I think... I think that is the best definition I've heard of what our job should be as foreign correspondents. And that is what I, of course, crediting Amira with the quotation, is the way I always try to tell people why we attempt to do the job we do, however imperfectly and with whatever flaws that exist. You do have at the moment in the United States, and you don't even need to nod when I say this because we all know it's true, a major problem with your media. I'm not sure how this started. I enjoyed watching Good night and good luck, more than I did Syriana. I liked Munich, by the way. That was a great movie for all kinds of reasons. Uh, sadly and pathetically criticized by Muslims, it was a great movie, Munich. But no, going back to this other issue, is I think that one of the problems that you have in the United States, and it does relate to the McCarthy period, is that journalists feel that to challenge authority when their country goes to war makes them look unpatriotic and thus potentially subversive. And there is also, particularly in this country, but it exists in my own, an osmotic, parasitic relationship between journalists and power. You only have to watch CNN. I won't ask you to watch CNN. If you do watch CNN by chance and watch a presidential press conference, you will understand the system of power. Mr. President, Mr. Pre Mr. President. Yes, John. Yes, Bob. So that's how it works. To be close to power, to have access. So that the Pentagon correspondent and the State Department correspondent and the White House correspondent becomes the spokesperson for the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. The, the phrase, American officials say, has now become the fulcrum. Or even after all the lies have been exposed of the, of the Iraqi war, all the lies about weapons of mass destruction in your favorite newspaper, the New York Times. Even after this, newspapers continue in this country, the mainstream press, which I think should be called the alternative press, and the alternative press should be called the mainstream press. Even after, well, you call it the alternative, not me, but even after, even after all the lies that were told and suborned upon journalism, still we find American officials say becomes the ice-cold crust of every story which you are meant to believe. Let me give you an example of this. When I was launching my book in LA back in November, I picked up, along with my bagel and my bland and tasteless uh, Californian coffee, I picked up <laughs> the Los Angeles Times. I can tell you what morning, November the 16th, 2005. Here it is. The uh, lead story, <coughs> the lead story says, in a battle of wits, Iraq's insurgency mastermind, we love masterminds in journalism, stays a step ahead of the United States. This is Zarqawi, who may or may not be alive. 
The story begins by Josh Meyer and Mark Mazzetti, Times staff writers, Washington. Bloody good place to report from Iraq from, as I'm sure you'll realize. <laughs> Here goes the first paragraph. Despite the recent arrest of one of his would-be suicide bombers in Jordan and some top aides in Iraq, have aides, right? Insurgency mastermind Abu Musab Zakawi has eluded capture, U.S. authorities say, because his network has a much better intelligence gathering operation than they do. I don't think that's actually true. I think that the American intelligence gathering operation is so ideologically led that they don't actually understand the intelligence they're getting. But anyway, the point of this story is the sourcing. I've already given you page one, column one, US authorities say, paragraph two, US officials said. Uh, column one again. Said one Justice Department counterterrorism official. Column two, officials said, U.S. authorities say, U.S. officials said. We go to page A10. Do not laugh, it gets better. Column one, several U.S. officials said, those officials said, <coughs> the officials confirmed, American officials complained, they said, U.S. officials stressed. Column three, U.S. Uh, authorities believe, said one senior U.S. intelligence official, U.S. officials said, Jordanian officials said, a little bit of a variation there. <laughs> Several U.S. officials said, we're into column four, U.S. officials said, column five. Several American officials said, column six. Officials say, say U.S. officials, U.S. officials said, one U.S. counterterrorism official said, welcome to American journalism, ladies and gentlemen. But you see the problem, don't you? You see the problem here. Let me give you a different kind of problem. This is an Associated Press story that ran in the New York Times on January 24 this year, more recently than this, and also ran, of course, on Fox News. Um, I'll ask you not to laugh at any point during my reading of the various paragraphs I've picked out. Fort Carson, Colorado. A military jury ordered a reprimand, but no jail time Monday for an army interrogator convicted of negligent homicide in the death of an Iraqi general who died after he stuffed him headfirst into a sleeping bag and sat on his chest. Earlier in the day during the sentencing hearing, Chief Warrant Officer Louis Welshover Jr. fought back tears. I deeply apologize, he said if my actions tarnished the soldiers serving in Iraq. Some of these soldiers, it later transpired in the court hearing, were actually present and watching and did nothing while he stuffed the general head first into the sleeping bag and sat on his chest. Welsh offer used his sleeping bag technique in the presence of lower ranking soldiers, it actually says. In an email to a commander, Welsh offer wrote that Restrictions on interrogation techniques were impeding the Army's ability to gather intelligence. The defense had argued a heart condition called the death of, caused the death of the Iraqi general, whose name is put down way down here at six paragraphs in as Major General Abed Hamed Mawush. At least he had an identity at some point in the story. But we continue on. Officials believed, the same officials presumably who populate the Los Angeles Times, had believed Mauhush, the, the Iraqi general, had information that would, quote, break the back of the whole insurgency. He knew all 40,000 insurgents, right? He didn't get his back broken, of course. It wasn't that. It was his chest that was presumably broken. Um, his wife, this is Welshoffer's wife, Barbara, testified that she was worried about providing for their three children if her husband, this is the chief warrant officer, was sentenced to prison but she said she was proud of him for contesting the case. I love him more for fighting this, she said, tears welling up in her eyes. Everybody's crying in this court case. He's always said that you need to do the right thing, and sometimes the right thing is the hardest thing to do. Torture's tough, ladies and gentlemen, believe me. But you see, what's wrong with this story is it is an intrinsically racist report. Didn't the general have a wife and children? Didn't she have a name? Didn't she cry a little bit? But she has been cut out of this story because this report does to the Iraqis what we do to the Iraqis every day because we don't care about them. And that is why we know the exact figure and number of American and British and other 
troops who die in Iraq, and we should, and we should honor them. It is a sacrifice. We know whether they have widows, children, where they come from, which state, and we should know. It is right that we should know and honor them. But we don't care about the Iraqis. What did George Bush say? There have been 30,000 Iraqi dead, he said, more or less. A which? Can you imagine Bush saying there are 2,000 American dead, more or less? I don't think he'd have let him get away with that. But he could get away with it with the Iraqis. When I went in August to the chief mortuary, the main mortuary in Baghdad, and looked up the numbers of dead on the computer linked to the Ministry of Health, which the Americans and British don't let us see, but the mortuary officials whom I know do let me see, it showed that 1,100 Iraqis had been killed by violence in Baghdad alone in just July of last year. Extrapolate that across, across all the cities, Najaf, Karbala, Bakuba, Ramadi, Fallujah, Amara, Samara, uh, Kirkuk, Mosul. You must be talking a minimum of 3,000 a month. That's 36,000 a year. So that figure of 100,000, which our own dear Prime Minister, Mr. Blair, sneered at, may actually be quite conservative. You see? These are the figures, but we don't care about the Iraqis. Alas, I don't think we ever did, because we didn't go to Iraq for Iraqis. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you tonight was really to question this issue of our press coverage and our failure to deal with the issues, which started, of course, here in this city among three or two other, three altogether on September 11, 2001, and that is the issue of the question, why? I've talked about this before here in New York, and I've talked about it in the West Coast of America, and it's a very serious problem. Um, I've said before that on September 11, 2001, I was crossing the Atlantic on my way here, and just before I boarded the plane, I heard on my mobile phone from London that a plane had flown into the World Trade Center. Light aircraft was the first report you may remember. Then as I was sitting down as we were taxiing to take off, um, I used the satellite phone in my seat, which will prove that I was trying flying business class, um, to call London. And they said a second plane, so I knew immediately this was not a tragedy, this was an attack, this was clearly. And as we were in the air, word came in that a helicopter had hit the Pentagon, then that, that was an airliner. So I went up to the presser, one of the um, dubious pleasure of flying across the Atlantic on average every three and a half weeks is to know a lot of the crews. And I said to the guy, you better tell the flight captain, whom I knew, the flight deck captain, you know, what's going on in America. It's under attack. And the pilot came out immediately and let the co-pilot fly the aircraft. And the stewardess said, there's a lot of people who are flying those aircraft. She said, they must have known. That's, we've never seen anything like this before. She said, where did the planes come from? And we didn't know at that point. We didn't know at that point whether the planes came from Latin America, Africa, Europe. We didn't realize they'd taken off from Boston and, and New York. And the person and I looked at each other and we went round the plane together looking for passengers we didn't like. I found 13. <laughs> Three in business class. The chief purser found 14. Of course, they were all the same. They were Muslims, weren't they? And I, of course, uh, because they were darker skinned and looked suspiciously at Bob, but because I was looking suspiciously at them or had worry beads or reading the Koran, who I thought their beards were too long. And I realized when I got back to the front of the aircraft again that Osama bin Laden, for I was sure it was he, had turned in about two or three minutes nice, friendly, liberal Bob into a racist. I was racially profiling the passengers, the totally innocent passengers on my aircraft. The last time I met bin Laden, he had said to me, we were at the top of a mountain at one of his camps, originally built by the CIA, of course, uh, and he said, Mr. Robert, I pray to God that he permits us to turn America into a shadow of itself. And when Victoria, my researcher, found my notebook for this book, having gone through 328,000 files, clippings, photographs, and videotapes, and so on, I found that on each side of this quotation from bin Laden, I'd drawn two uh, vertical lines with the word rhetoric, question mark, written next to it. Of course, it wasn't rhetoric. I was wrong. But I got back to the front of that aircraft, and I realized that bin Laden 
I don't think he was trying to have this preposterous idea of the clash of civilizations. I think he was dividing the innocent from the innocent. And he, we would succeed in dividing the innocent from the innocent, I thought, if someone, anyone, was to claim that these international crimes against humanity, which is what September the 11th, 2001 was, if anyone was to can claim that this had changed the world forever, then bin Laden would win. And sure enough, your president said just that. And from that moment, the doors opened to the torture of Abu Ghraib prison and the killing of detainees and rendition and secret prisons and wiretapping. And that was the phrase that opened it. The question why was not to be asked. When I got back to Europe that night and I saw on the television over and over again, of course, the Twin Towers falling in this biblical horror, indeed, I said to myself, you know, the, the smoke and dust across New York and Manhattan, that New York was now a shadow of itself, to use bin Laden's prescient and horrific phrase. But the one thing we were not supposed to do then was ask the question, why? We could ask who did it, 19 Arabs who claimed they were Muslims, how box cutters, airplanes, tall buildings. But the moment we asked the question why, the sky fell on us. Because as the late Edward Said said, there is one taboo subject which you face here. You can talk about blacks, gays, lesbians, but not about America's relationship with the Middle East and with Israel. That is totally <laughs> verboten. And especially in the light of the international crimes against humanity of September 11, 2001, you must deal with that issue. Very odd things happened when I asked the question why. A well-known, apparently liberal academic at Harvard, who shall remain nameless, <laughs> it was Alan Dershowitz, of course, yes, <laughs> came on Irish radio and said to me when I was saying, why, 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 Robert Fisk, you are a dangerous man, you are anti-American, and that is the same as being anti-Semitic. I have the tape, by the way. But you see, you get the point. To ask the question, why, was to turn you into a Nazi. I got a shoal of postcards afterwards, by the way, from the United States, from various states, but all the same, telling me that my mother was Adolf Eichmann's daughter. Now, my mum, Peggy, who died a few years before, was in the Royal Air Force in the Second World War and joined up to mend radios in damaged Spitfires so they could be put back in the air to fight the Luftwaffe in 1940. But I don't think the letter writers cared. That was not the point. The purpose of those postcards was to shut up me and any other journalist who asked the question, why? I mean, why not ask why? If there is a crime committed in the streets now, the first thing the NYPD do is they look for a motive. But when we had an international crime against humanity, the one thing we were not permitted to do was look for a motive. How very odd. Like, they were Arabs. That means they come from the Middle East. Is there a problem out there? Huh? You see, you see the thing. That night on television, uh, BBC uh, World Service Television brought on an um, expert on the press who said, I won the prize for bad taste of September 11th for asking why. Well, I'm sorry, guilty. Definitely guilty. Why? You know, back in 1993, eight years before um, the International Crimes Against Humanity, I made a series of films for the Discovery Channel and Channel 4 in Britain about Muslims in the West. And the subtitle was, Why Muslims Are Coming to Hate the West. And Part of this, a small section of this film, was made in Bosnia. We actually filmed in Lebanon, South Lebanon, Israel, Palestine in quotes, because it doesn't actually exist. Um, we filmed in Egypt, we filmed in Bosnia, we filmed in Croatia, um, we filmed in Poland. We had a section on the, on the Jewish Holocaust. But I'm going to show you now a little clip of, of this film in which I walk into a mosque in a village called Chela, a somewhat younger Bob, I hasten to add, 
And Chela was a village I'd been in a year earlier, captured by the Serbs who said they were going to protect the village imam and the Muslims and the mosque in the village. So I was going back to see this village a year later with a film crew. You'll see what happened. I should tell you, which is not on the film, because at the time I made it, we had no knowledge of what was to come, that when Victoria went back through the detailed cuts of this film, she discovered that I had walked into this mosque on September the 11th, 1993, and just listen to what I say when I walk into the mosque, which has just been blown up by the policemen who are escorting us. Just listen to what I say, because I drew in my breath when I edited this sequence to show you. Uh, can we go ahead, uh, Doug? And maybe, can we pull this back a little bit? Whoever's going to help me so that people here can see the subtitle? <laughs> Ethnic cleansing. How easily we reporters accepted this phrase. The Muslims who lived in these devastated homes were raped and murdered by the Serbs, not because they were ethnically different from their Serb attackers, but because the Serbs wanted the Muslims' land, and they got it. Our reports of their plunder made no difference. A year ago, the Independent sent me into Serbian Bosnia to search for a village in which Muslims still lived. I found a village called Cela. It had a pretty mosque and a friendly imam who lived in a cottage next door. The Serbs promised to protect them. Now I was going back to see them again, accompanied by two watchful Serb policemen. I'm sure it's the mosque. I went in there before. Keep going, keep going. This, this I'm sure. Yes, I, I, rem I remember went to, going in here before. This is the mosque. Right. <clears throat> I see the problem here. Can you ask the policeman what happened to this yes, mask? I mean, I, I, last time I was here, I walked inside it. It was uh, ordinary. What happened, Kathy? Okay. Can you ask him? On the što se dogodilo tu? Za jami or za sve? It's a... Uh... No, no, no picture. Okay, okay. right. Yeah, he'll take your phone away. Okay, all right. Part of a school book. I knew what had happened. How long would these Muslims put up with this sort of violence? How can I forget the place where I work, the Middle East? When Muslims there hit out at the West, we say we don't understand them. Mindless terrorism is the phrase we like to use about them. And every time I see things like this, I wonder what the Muslim world has in store for us. Maybe my reports should always end with the same phrase, watch out. Well, no more mask. It had been blown up with explosives. No one would say who did it. And there wasn't any point in asking the Serb police. And here was the cottage in which the Muslim Imam and his family had given me coffee just a year ago. They had disappeared, ethnically cleansed, only a few days ago. No one would say where they were. But I recognized them from the old family snapshots. These were the people who gave me coffee a year ago. To this day, I don't know where they are. The end of the line for the Muslims of Bosnia. Despite our millions of words, despite the pictures of all our television colleagues, have we journalists made the slightest difference to this tragedy?
these men and women were driven out of their homes this morning. Muslims, dispossessed, homeless, betrayed. Why did they throw the Muslims out of Bosnia? Why have they done this to you? Can I ask you why are you leaving Bosnia? In the Middle East, as well as Bosnia, I've spent 17 years writing about these people. It would be nice to think the world listened to us journalists occasionally, but governments have grown used to ignoring our reports. If you still believe in the new world order, you shouldn't be watching this. Governments want us to think about peace in the Middle East. They'd rather we never saw this, never wrote about it. They'd rather we shut up. Sadika, this is you? Sadika, yes. This is you. And this? Your husband. He's dead. And, and this here is? This is your mother here who's sitting behind you now. What do you think when you look back at these days now? For these Muslims, this is their moment of despair their day of catastrophe. An hour ago, they were Bosnian Muslims in their own homes. Now they are refugees. Just a little local train to take them north to a refugee camp, another country, to another world, to be scattered to the ends of the earth.